Uh, we don't allow jurors to say, well, you know, he looks guilty. But man, new develop, new witness, new uh, evidence could develop in the next 20 years that will show that we're, okay, we're asking you right now, if you're saying right now, given this evidence, that he is clear, in your mind, that best inference is he's guilty, then render the verdict. If you think he's, he's not guilty, then render the not guilty. But the point is, we, we don't allow you to say, well, right now it looks like X, but 20 years from now, things could change. Look, if things change 20 years from now, we'll retry this guy, okay? We're talking about what does it look like today? It's funny, I was going to bring up a phone call I had with a friend of mine. The okay. other day. He, he lives in Kentucky, and uh, he's he's a Christian, but he's kind of agnostic in a way, you know. Okay. He, he kind of, he struggled he got, he with got it. questions, basically, about certain yeah, things, Yeah, right? a lot of questions. Yeah. Okay. And uh, one thing he was saying to me was, well, we can explain most things through science, and maybe there's this little sliver where God can come in. And immediately I went to the bookshelf, I pulled out God's crime scene, I was like, well, here's 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 eight things that science can't necessarily explain. And I think it's 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 such a great approach because, you know, you hear a lot of atheists say, well, there's no evidence for God, or how could there even in principle be evidence for God? And you're really just simply asking the question, well, can we explain everything in the universe by staying in the right. universe? Or is there any evidence yeah. that we need to go outside of it? Well, look at it this way. If we were at a crime scene together, and I had a, a dead woman at a crime scene, and we're standing on the one side of the yellow tape, and and you said to me, um, I think her husband is the one who did this based on what I see inside that crime scene. I can see several things around her body. I can see several pieces of evidence related to the body. I can see the context of the kind of room we're in. Uh, based on what I see inside the yellow tape, I think the best and most reasonable explanation for this murder is her husband. And then my other partner says, well, no, man, are you crazy? She's got a roommate uh, who lives with the couple. Uh, in, come on. That's the one who I think is responsible. Okay, great. Each of you then has to demonstrate why it is that you think your cause can best explain what's on the other side of the yellow tape. If you think the husband did it, show me why. If you think that you're the roommate did it, their roommate, show me why. What we have here is we're looking across the yellow tape at the universe, and there are things in the crime scene that we all agree exist. We have to explain how the crime scene got here, how did the universe get here, why does it appear to be designed, fine-tuned at least, and that's not even a controversial uh, topic. I mean, most people on both sides, even secular, atheist, astrophysicists, will agree to the appearance of fine-tuning. I think actually the fine-tuning in the universe is one of the things that drives, it's the tail that wags the dog on the multiverse theorist, if you ask me. And then you've got to explain the origin of life in the universe, the appearance of design and biology, consciousness, free agency, objective moral truths, even whatever standard you think you're using to determine that something is evil. These are things we all have to explain. Now, I would say on this side of the yellow tape that I think a personal, all-powerful being is the best and most reasonable inference, the best causal agent to explain what's on the other side of the yellow tape. Now, my partner might say, you know what? No, I think natural forces alone Space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry, that's all I can work with, can explain everything on the other side of the tape. Okay, in the same way that both my partners had a burden of proof, both of us in this scenario have a burden of proof. It's typically said that you are the only one as a theist who has a burden of proof. Well, well, hang on, that's not how it works. How it works is we look at the crime scene and we posit a causal agent or force or factor and then each of us makes a case for why we think our cause is the best explanation. That naturalist is positing a cause. He's saying that whatever's in there, you can get that with just space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry. That's his claim. He has an equal burden of proof. Now, it turns out that that it's, you'll sometimes hear people say, well, yeah, well, you may have found the eight things we cannot yet explain. Okay. But when we go to a jury trial, we, we pull the trigger on, no, I shouldn't say it that way. We, we render a <laughs> verdict um, based on where we are evidentially today. Uh, we don't allow jurors to say, well, you know, he looks guilty. But man, new, develop, new, witness, new uh, evidence could develop in the next 20 years that will show that we're, okay, we're asking you right now. If you're saying right now, given this evidence, that he is clear, in your mind, that best inference is he's guilty, then render the verdict. If you think he's, he's not guilty, then render the not guilty. But the point is, we, we don't allow you to say, well, right now it looks like X, but 20 years from now, things could change. Look, if things change 20 years from now, we'll retry this guy, okay? We're talking about what does it look like today? And so I think it's fair for us to say that, yeah, right now, 
Science doesn't answer those questions and can't answer those questions. It's been trying to answer them for a long time and has, has really failed. And by the way, if, and, and it's not as though well they don't have answers. Well, they'll offer you answers. But none of these scientific experts agree on the answer. And each one thinks the other answer offered by the other scientists is ludicrous. So if you think that there's like consensus on multiverse theory to explain fine tuning, oh no, there's not. As a matter of fact, there's a bunch of astrophysicists who think that's a cheat. They would reject that altogether on the basis of the same scientific evidence. So here's what I'm, I'm offering. I'm saying here right now, I think the best inference for those eight characteristics of the universe is an all-powerful, non-spatial, non-temporal, non-material um, cause that is the fine tuner with a purpose in mind who is fine tuning the universe to sustain itself and support carbon-based life who is the source of information as a mind the source of information we see in the genetic code so that life can originate in that universe and is the designer behind the design we see in biology and because he is designing in his image as a mind who is a free agent he designs creatures that have minds and act freely and because he is, by his very nature, the source of moral truth, and he, we sense this moral obligations on transcendent objective moral claims, well, we don't have obligations between forces. Obligations are only between persons. So now we need a moral person to whom we are feeling obligated. And he's even the standard of righteousness by which we would say, you know what, when it violates that standard, he is the sunshine that causes the shadow, right? He is the source of moral truth that when it's violated, we sense that violation. We call that evil. Well, that's a reasonable inference that there's a being like that out there that accounts for all these things we see. And it's a much more satisfying answer than these. The, and I've kind of listed in the book all the alternative ways that people try to explain those eight things. I even did a diagram, and you can see the dozens of explanations that are offered, and these guys don't agree with each other. Not only that, whatever someone's offering for the beginning of the universe will not get you objective moral truths. It will not get you um, mind. So you need another way to explain that. Well, it turns out there's one explanation we offer as theists that unifies all the evidence and accounts for all the evidence, and that is the idea that there is a, a, a supernatural being that fits that suspect profile. And that's why in the book, I don't even try to talk about any of this from a biblical perspective. You don't need to do that. That's not what I did. I, when I first read the miracle accounts in the Gospels, I thought, that's ludicrous. Whatever's true about Jesus, fine. But this miracle stuff is clearly not true because miracles don't occur. But as I kind of stepped back and said, well, now I need to kind of ask myself, what do I, if, if God exists and he's that kind of being, the being that could create all eight things of those, those eight things in the universe, that's a powerful, personal, divine being that could actually accomplish all of the miracles that are in the New Testament. So I need to know first, does that God exist? Because if he does, why am I questioning this small potato miracle stuff in the New Testament? If that God exists, the most amazing miracle of all time is Genesis 1, right? Everything from nothing. And I'm thinking walking on water is pretty small potatoes compared to that. I mean, hmm. the, the resurrection is small potatoes. So it opens the door to some of the stuff that we see in the New Testament.